Now, I think we can all agree that so far the debate between the Leave campaign and the Remain campaign has been a very polarized one. There's been a lot of insults, a lot of mudslinging, none of it very, uh, very informative. But in actual fact, when you look at what both sides say about the European Union, what strikes me the most is that they're actually very similar. And they're similar in the following way. They both grossly exaggerate uh, the role that the European Union plays. So we just heard from Edwina that apparently the EU puts food on the table. Uh, we've heard very often that the EU is responsible for peace since 1945. Uh, that's what the Remain sign tells us. They tell us that there will be some sort of economic catastrophe if the UK leaves uh, the European Union. Now, all of these are gross exaggerations. Uh, the historical... You did say... I did not say the Well, can you just let me finish then, please? Can you just let me finish? Can you 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 let me finish? Okay, Chris, go on. Uh, the, um, uh, the historical record uh, for the European Union um, is that in the 1950s, what really drove peace in Europe was economic growth, the economic boom of the 1950s and the 1960s. That was overwhelmingly the reason. The European coal and steel community that was set up in the early 50s was a very small and quite marginal affair. Um, it was actually wound up in the 1957 Treaty of Rome because the job of the coal and steel community had been to rationalize the coal and steel industries in Europe in a context of what they thought was going to be overproduction. Because of the boom, there was no need to rationalize those, in, those, those industries, and the purpose of the coal and steel community disappeared. Um, so what really drove peace in Europe was, uh, was, was economic success. Now, the historical record on that, I think, is quite strong. So the Remain side grossly exaggerate the role of the European Union. They tell us often that the constitutional order of the British state depends on being a member of the European Union. That if the UK to, were to leave, the state would collapse, a little bit as if the UK was Bosnia-Herzegovina. It's not. Um, but the Leave side are equally guilty of exaggerating the role of the European Union. They tell us all the time that there is a European superstate that is trampling on our democratic freedoms. And if only we can leave the EU, some sort of pristine and perfect national democracy will, uh, will emerge. Both of those sides don't really get at what the European Union is, and they don't make, I think, a good case. And the Leave side doesn't make a good case for Brexit based on its misunderstanding of what the, the EU is. So let me give you just in a, sh a few short um, points my interpretation of the European Union and my case for, uh, for Brexit. People often ask me, they say, can you explain to me what the EU is? I don't really understand. Can you just tell me as simply as possible? So what I tell them is this. I say the European Union, a good way of thinking of it is like a mirage. We know how a mirage works. In the distance, it seems very clear, very tangible. You almost feel as if you can touch it. Then you get a bit closer, it starts to, to tremble, starts to shimmer. And when you finally get there, it's gone. It disappears. Now, the European Union is like that. Seen from national capitals, seen from places like, like here, like Manchester, seen from lots of different parts of Europe, it seems pretty clear and tangible. It has its own laws, its own officials, um, it has its own institutions. But as you get closer to Brussels, this image starts to shimmer and it starts to tremble. When you finally get to the European quarter in Brussels, it disappears altogether. And what do you find? You find our own leaders, our own prime ministers and heads of state regularly coming to Brussels to meet in the European Council. They do that every other month, sometimes more often when there's a crisis going on. Our ministers constantly traveling to Brussels to sign off on legislation in the Council of Ministers. Our own officials fill the Eurostar. Officials from France fill the TGVs. The, the officials from, from the Netherlands fill the Talis trains. They converge on Brussels and they work and craft legislation on a weekly basis. So at the heart of the European Union is not some kind of super state. Only 25,000 people work for the European Commission. That's almost as much as the BBC. Um, or rather, the BBC is almost as much as that. It's not a lot of people. It's a tiny bureaucracy for 500 million citizens. So there is no European super state when you get to Brussels. It's just our own governments. Now, what's the riddle of the European Union? It's to answer the question, why does it not seem like that? Why is it still the case that if it's run by governments, we get this impression that it's somehow separate from our governments? It's over there. It tells us what to do. And the answer is this. Governments today across Europe, not just the British government, but governments across Europe, do not feel as if they can rule on their own. They do not feel as if they can govern alone. They argue that they can only govern properly if they're the member of some sort of bigger club. Now, people explain that in different ways. The most conventional explanation 
is that we have uh, so many global threats and challenges, globalization, financialization, international terrorism, all of these abstract nouns that are really difficult to grasp. That's what means that governments have to work together. Now, in my view, the real answer to this, the real explanation is much closer to home. The truth is that governments for the last 30 to 40 years across Europe, not just in this country, have suffered from a deep crisis of legitimacy and a deep crisis of their own authority. Politicians systematically have retreated into the state. Citizens have retreated into their own private spheres and their own private lives. What is left is a big void between the state, between governments and their citizens is a void. Now the task of government in the 21st century in Europe, and this is what politicians think about, is how do they govern across that void? Um, the relationship between states and citizens used to be one of representation. Today it's one of antagonism. Politicians overwhelmingly think of their voters as problems to be managed, not as people or as groups to be properly represented. Now the European Union, the reason why it is what it is, is that it's the prime mechanism, it's not the only one, but it's the prime mechanism today for ruling across the void, for governing at a distance, for managing this antagonistic relationship with, uh, with, uh, with your own society. That's the purpose, the political purpose of the, of the European Union. Now, what will remain uh, achieve? What will be the result of remain? To be perfectly honest, there will be a sigh of relief across the rest of Europe. European political elites will say, thank you very much, we're glad that's over, let's get back to normal. The EU has a long history of ignoring crises and just pretending it never, it never happened. But in this country, I think there will be a long-standing legacy uh, of, of mistrust, of, of deepening mistrust. Let me just ask you, who will believe in the independence of the Bank of England after the 23rd of June? After the Bank of England has so firmly backed the Remain campaign, even um, uh, uh, when the, the economic case uh, uh, merits a much more balanced judgment. People like Mervyn King, former governor of the Bank of England, has been very unhappy and has been clear about this, about the decision taken by Mark Carney. So who's going to believe in the independence of the Bank of England? Who's going to believe in the independence of any of the institutions of the British state? Because they've so firmly been politicised by the government in order to win this campaign. Our Prime Minister wants to win this campaign at any costs including severely destabilizing the British state. So the legacy of Remain after the 23rd of June, if we stay in the EU, will be this simmering and deepening sense of disenchantment and distrust that citizens feel vis-a-vis -vis their own politicians and their own government institutions. On the Brexit side, uh, there will not be some sort of magical solution to this problem of citizens simply not feeling represented or trusting their politicians. This legacy of distrust will not disappear overnight. Absolutely not. Eurosceptics often tell us that if the UK leaves, we will discover some sort of perfect democratic life in Britain which has been taken away from us. That is simply untrue. But there will be one crucial difference, which is this crisis of authority, this crisis of legitimacy that our government has suffered for a long time now, will no longer be foisted onto Brussels. The blame avoidance culture which is pervasive in government today can no longer exist in the same way. People can't consistently say we have to do this because Brussels tells us or when something goes wrong we say it's the fault of the, the EU. Politicians I think will be forced for the first time in a long time to take some responsibility for the decisions they make and if they can't then it's up to us as citizens to properly hold them to account. So I think Brexit holds the possibility, also the risk and the challenge, but the possibility um, of taking on and finally um, uh, grappling uh, with this problem of governments uh, not having a real relationship of representation with, with citizens. That's the great opportunity. That's also the responsibility of us, I think, as citizens on the 23rd of June to vote to leave the, the EU. Thank you very much. Thanks very much.